Our lecture title this evening, The Amazing Revival of Israel, a sign that Christ is about to return, is an exciting subject indeed, particularly when we consider the comments made by our chairman tonight that this world indeed is rapidly lapsing into a time of sorrows. There is hardly a government that's not racked with corruption. Violence and lawlessness is multiplying in the earth. It is a time of fear and expectation. And we have in front of this world an amazing sign. Now, Israel is a reality today. It is a revived nation. It is a happy living nation, just some 70 years old. And it is a modern miracle. Now you see, what it really means is this, that despite 2,000 years of dispersion and alienation, this people are back among the nations again as an independent nation. That is a miracle. However, that is today's reality. And you cannot divide Israel from their God. So it is a, it, it, it's a religious matter as far as this world might be concerned. So that we read, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 11, God says, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So whereas some of the major empires, such as the Babylonian Empire, such as the Persian Empire, and others have disappeared, the Assyrian, the Roman, but Israel is still with us. It's a reality today, and it's all because of their God. Now just a few facts about Israel as we make our way into our subject. Uh, basically, the nation was founded officially as Israel in 1948. It has a population reaching about, almost now, about 9 million people. If you look at the map that's up on the screen there, uh, you will see that uh, it's a tiny dot in Australia and it's not much more than that in a, in a, in a city like New Z a country like New Zealand. Now in 70 short years, Israel has accomplished what many nations haven't been able to do. It is a phenomenal reality. Israel has the second largest number of companies trading on Wall Street after the US. Israel has the highest ratio of university degrees uh, to uh, the population of the world. Per capita, the highest ratio. So it's a very intellectual nation. And then finally, Israel represents the leading edge of innovation and technology and that was a comment made by Bill Gates. Now Israel is a phenomena that will not go away. And despite all the opposition that there is in this world, they cannot get rid of the Jew. Now interestingly also, Israel is one of nine countries with nuclear weapons. It is one of eight countries that can launch their own satellites into space. But it is a country that is, is at the centre of, of debate and, and intense uh, uh, hatred, if you like, among the nations. So that we see on that screen down here in the bottom left-hand corner, a little picture of United Nations, which is intensely anti-Semitic. United Nations. And as we read in the scriptures in Zechariah 12 and verse 3, and in that day God says, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered against it. And that's exactly what we see today. Your Bible is becoming a reality. It is a book that we cannot dis uh, 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 ignore or discount. It is coming to pass right before 
our eyes. Now, Israel, yes, it is a unique nation. And it's unique because they are God's witnesses among the nations. So that in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, the God through the prophet says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Israel's God is the creator. He is the omnipotent God. He is the only God and the nation of Israel, the people, uh, the Jewish people, are a witness uh, to him. So the future of this world will continue to revolve around them and their God with them. So Israel is God's timepiece. They are set forth in the Bible to give us an indicator and a reminder that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return and God's kingdom will be established. Now just, just, just put this in your mind. If you are able to step back and look upon world history and the nations and you wanted to bring before all peoples a sign that you have a purpose with this earth and that purpose involves the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, what sign would you select? Well, it's obviously one that you can't step over, you can't ignore, you can't close your eyes. It's just right in front of you and it's witnessing to incredible achievements. That sign is Israel. And on that basis, they have become God's timepiece. Now I want to take you through just a little um, discourse of the Lord Jesus Christ where he himself is going to basically tell us that the revival of Israel is a sure sign of his second coming. So we come to what is known as the Olivet Prophecy. And the Lord Jesus Christ has just been in the temple in Jerusalem with his disciples. And they see various ones putting money into the collection, trumpets and so forth. They look at the exquisite building, they're impressed with all the jewels and so on. And then they walk through the Kedron Valley up the other side onto the Mount of Olives. Basically they would have sat down and looked across and saw that temple like you see up there. And in Luke chapter 21, which is one of those areas where this is recorded, Matthew 24 is the other, it says there right at the top of our screen, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said. And recording, we're going across to Matthew 24 verse 2, he said, see ye not all these things? Have a good look at them. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He was virtually signalling that the temple, Jerusalem, would be destroyed and the body politic of Israel would be eclipsed. This is a, 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 a historical monument He's beginning to explain and describe to his disciples things that were going to come to pass in order that they may cope. So then we find in Matthew 24 and verse 3 he says, right at the top of our screen, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world, or as in the original Greek language it means the end of the age, the Jewish age, the end of the Jewish political reality as it was then. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is interested in the whole scope of Israel's history, if you like, and future, of God's unfolding plan. So he tells them initially that this city and this country, as it were, is going to be dissolved, eclipsed, destroyed. 
But he's also going to tell them that there will come a time when it will be revived, when it will be reconstituted, when it will become the kingdom of God on earth. So we see right across this spectrum the uh, negatives and the positives, the dissolution and the reconstitution. Now one of those men sitting on that mountain with the Lord Jesus Christ was a disciple called Peter. And a little later on he wrote some comments about this occasion, about this experience. And in the second of Peter, chapter 3 and verse 10, he said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, unexpected. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now it's, it's highly symbolic language. But what the Lord Jesus is telling his disciples, and Peter is now referring to us, that the whole system of government, of religion, of identity in Israel is going to be completely destroyed. And what's left of Jewry will be abandoned as, uh, as refugees, as it were, wandering through the earth. But he also mentioned that there's another side to our story which the Lord unfolded. He said, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, this is a matter of promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So this is going to be a whole new Israel, a whole new government, a whole new religion, which is what we read, really, in Ezekiel 37 tonight. Wherefore, he says, Beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. So there's a message here for his disciples, and here Peter is referring that on. Now, AD 70 is a historical fact. That war came, the Romans destroyed that city of Jerusalem, and here on the screen we have in AD 70, and again in 135, AD, the Roman Empire brutally put down Jewish revolts in Judea, destroying Jerusalem, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews and sending hundreds of thousands more into slavery and exile. And so came the end of what they called traditional Judaism at that time, with temple worship, the law of Moses. Now looking at this, <coughs> the destruction of that city came in AD 70, as we've seen, Matthew 23 verse 37 to 39. And the captives, uh, many were taken off, of course, into Rome, and we see in that little insert the, uh, uh, the menorah being carried uh, on the back of uh, Israeli captives and heading off to Rome. But the interesting thing about this diagram is that what had happened with the complete destruction of Jerusalem it became a valley of dry bones. It became the testimony to a nation that is now completely dead. And in Ezekiel 37, the prophet Ezekiel was asked, prompted and asked by God, can these bones live? And from a human perspective, you'd probably say definitely no. But they were going to live. There was going to be a, a political resurrection of the nation, which the Lord Jesus Christ had predicted on the Mount of Olives. So then, let's just have a look at some of the signs of the coming destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, as it were, transform your thinking along with those disciples. And the Lord's saying to them, there's going to be some huge and, 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 and mighty events occurring in the near future. Now I want you to be ready. Look for this. You will find, now we're reading basically Matthew 24, 4 to 14, there will be deceptions, errors. There will be false claims. If we put it in our modern language, in our modern language, fake news. There'll be wars. There'll be rumours of war. There will be international unrest and provocation. 
There will be natural disasters such as famine and pestilence and earthquakes. It will be a time of sorrows. It will be a time of human suffering with no answers. It's going to be a time of religious persecution against fundamental Bible belief. There will be social unrest and disorder. There will be abounding iniquity which will serve to take God out of the heart of man and leave him with a cold love. And then the Lord says to his disciples, He that endures unto the end shall be saved. Well, they are the signs of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And there's a few signs there that are very, very familiar to us even today. And it is that the end of ages, we are living at the end of the Gentile age. This was the end of the Jewish age. And there are some aspects about circumstances leading into those times which have a very clear similarity. Now I want to take you to what the Lord said about the future. Now bearing in mind he's got his disciples around him, they're looking over the Kedron Valley, they see the Temple Mount and our Lord looks at his disciples and he says, you know there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. So here's our first sign of reconstruction. Now the sun and the moon and the stars are natural bodies that God has put into the heavens to have an influence or a governing effect upon the earth. So they represent the aerials of government. And the sign that this world would see is the re-emergence of a nation that had long been dead for 1900 years, a valley of dead, dry bones. And it's now resurrected and coming up among the nations, as the Lord said, among other trees as well. He says, Behold, the fig tree, which is a symbol of Israel, which we can trace through the scriptures <coughs> and substantiate that. So here we have a fig tree coming up among the trees. That's an amazing sign. There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Now if those disciples needed a little bit of extra explanation, he then spoke to them about a parable of the fig tree. And he said to them, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. So when you're standing out and you have a look at a fig tree in the midst of winter, what you see is up there on the screen. It looks like a rose bush at the same time of the year, a dead stick. In this case, a dead tree. He has no promise of, of, of leaves and fruit. However, summer is coming, a different season, a different period, a new period. And lo and behold, coming out of those dead sticks are leaves and then fruit. And so he's giving now this sweep, if you like, of Israel's history and destiny. The nation is going to be eclipsed as it was in AD 70, but it's going to be politically raised again and as we understand from Ezekiel 37, it's going to be the centre of worship in this world. Israel is going to be a purified nation and all mankind are going to recognise that Israel's God is the true and living creator. Now see what he says here. He says, so likewise you, when you see these, come, uh, these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So they were sitting at a time 
when they were going to begin to see this whole sweep of events, of course, half the story they wouldn't be alive to see, but certainly the beginning they would. And the Lord is saying, you're not going to have to wait a long time to begin to see this whole sweep and flow of things. So he said, the generation who witnesses these things, the fig tree budding, will be a generation that sees the Lord coming in his kingdom. Now there's, there's a little interesting uh, turn on language here and basically if I just keep it very simple, what he's saying is to those disciples, you see the beginning of this, this, this uh, <coughs> procession of things, you know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now that expression kingdom of God uh, does not necessarily always mean the literal kingdom of God being established. Now I'll give you an example. The Lord was walking along with his disciples and there were Pharisees with him. And they asked him, when would the kingdom of God come? And the Lord said, the kingdom of God is among you. So if the kingdom of God is among you, it had to refer to the Lord Jesus himself. And what our Lord is telling his disciples, that when these things begin to come to pass, you'll know that I'm in control. And he was in AD 70. So very interesting. Now let's have a look at the signs of the coming of the Lord which uh, are given to us in Luke 21 verse 27. And we read here, now these are signs appropriate to our own times. They, they were future to, to, um, to, to the circumstances there with the disciples. So he says, And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now that, that, that is a, an amazing little description because the power and the great glory and the coming of the Lord is our Lord returning or being revealed to the earth in the presence of divine authority and power, but with him will be his immortal and faithful brethren or saints. So then, here we go. In verse 25 of Luke 21, we're going to have a political revival of Israel. Signs in the sun, moon and stars. Then in verse 24 he tells us that Jerusalem's going to return to Jewish control. The time of the Gentiles will be over. Do we see Jerusalem in Jewish control today? Number three here, international turmoil and distress. That is our newspaper today, isn't it? That's our reality today. World problems, number four, civil and social unrest with no answers. We live in a country where we don't understand that, but just go across to Asia and the Middle East and Africa itself and you'll find that that is exactly right. Now, this is interesting. Point number five, governments will lose their power to control. The powers of heaven, he says, shall be shaken. They will lose their power to control. Pause and consider what's happening around the world. Washington, Canberra and many other countries in this world are witnessing a corrupt and declining form of government where governing becomes simply an exercise of digging up mud and throwing at each other. And eventually it will finish like the Lord said. They will lose their power to control. And that will lead to fear and death and, and that will be prevalent all around. Lawlessness, which we're seeing increasing alarmingly now, and that's the result of desperation. Verse 26, Jesus Christ, who is styled here the Son of Man, will come with the power and authority of heaven, verse 27. And finally, our last point, there is comfort for believers. The brethren of Christ will have an eternal future. And you know what he said to his disciples? 
He said, when you begin to see these things come to pass, he said, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption's drawing nigh. Now when you look up, you are acknowledging that whatever you see around you in this world, God has it under control. But then when he says, lift up your head, it is basically he has your personal answers. Your redemption is drawing nigh. So, what an interesting story that is. Now I want to just come across to, um, to uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 where Ezekiel is given a, almost a, a, a step-by-step description of this political resurrection of Israel. So we read here in Ezekiel 37 and verse 12 to 14, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, that is to these bones, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So there is the, the promise, if you like, of God. He says, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And we do see that primary fulfilment today in the land of Israel. I will put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. And really, that's the source of much consternation throughout the whole world today. Israel's presence in the land. So then, in Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16, Jeremiah the prophet says, Behold, this is, this is really God through him, I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of, out of the holes of the rocks of the earth. So this is the process, first fishing, then hunting, but eventually those people are going to come out of nowhere, as it were, and back into their land. So this is how it happened. 1897, it was, the, it, it was Theodore Herzl and Zionism, and he called for Israel to return back to that land and to establish it again as a homeland for Jews. This was a fishing. But then there came in 1939-40 the Second World War, the Hunter, the Holocaust, the brutality of Adolf Hitler, and he drove them back. He was a hunter. So with the fishing and the hunting, what we see is a regathering of those people back from out the four corners of the earth. So the restoration and revival of Israel as a nation and the people was mentioned to uh, Ezekiel as a valley, of, a, valley, a, a valley of dry bones, skeletons, there was noise, there was shaking, there was sinew, there was flesh, there was skin, there was breath and there was an exceeding great army. They're the facts in Ezekiel 37. So how do those facts indeed work out? AD 70, scattered for 2,000 years. Then the skeleton, 1882, the first Aliyah begins to Palestine. Then there's the noise in 1897 with Theodor Herzl meeting in Baal, Switzerland. Then there's the shaking in 1914, the First World War and the agitation that led to this development of the Israelitish body. The sinew in 1917, Lord Balfour declared support to an agreement for a homeland of the Jew. Then we come to 1922, the League of Nations confirmed that Britain had a mandate in the land. Then we come to 1948 and the state of Israel, oh, sorry, 47, and there was a plan which was led by the UN to, to partition the land that we now call Israel, which was then Palestine. 48, one year later, likewise in the UN, the state of Israel was proclaimed, and then 1967, Israel achieved victory over the surrounding enemies and took again control of the city of Jerusalem. So step by step by step, these things have now become a reality before us. So let's just now visit very quickly the voice of the prophets, showing that God was signalling these things 
from a long time ago. And we read of these voices, Jeremiah 30 verse 3, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. So you see, these things were signalled way, 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 even before the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read in Jeremiah 31, 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, gather them from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and the one who labours with child together. A great throng shall return there. So all kinds of people are making their way back to the land as per the voice of the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 9, They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them, I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. There's a relationship between God and his people and he's bringing them back home after nearly 2,000 years. So hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles of far off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. So we find that that's the message for our world today. Israel's God is a reality, he is true, and these things are happening under his control. Well, let's just have a little look at, uh, at what, uh, is, uh, what has happened over those 65 years. Well, uh, the first 65 years, the state is born. Sixty-five years. Which country has been able to achieve those things in that small space of time? It is a remarkable miracle. I'll show you the next five years shortly. Well, everybody in this world is trying to get rid of them. It's called anti-Semitism, anti-Israel. Leading the way, as we've already said, is the United Nations. There's another very influential group in this world called BDS, which is boycott, divest, divest and sanction. And that's their policy against Israel. So there's a huge agenda of anti-Semitism. And of course, leading the way with the UN is UNESCO, which is basically 
delegitimized Israel in the land as a legal uh, a, a statue. There's been three attempts to destroy that nation. Three attempts. In 1956, there was what they called the, 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 the Sinai War, where Israel decimated the Egyptians. Then 1967, the Six Day War, where Israel took back Jerusalem. 1973, where they fought off nations all around them. What an amazing thing when you consider the numbers, the odds against this people. It is undoubted that their God is behind them. Now Israel, as you will know, is surrounded by hateful enemies. <clears throat> and I don't think you could get greater hate than there is among Hezbollah and Hamas. Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the south, in Gaza, and of course add to that the Iranians and the, the Syrians combining together in the east. Israel is surrounded by hateful enemies. Now I want to demonstrate to you just how different Israel is among the nations. I don't think you'll hardly find another nation just like this. Now despite many enemies in Syria, Israel is a benevolent nation. They have a moral integrity like none other. They have shown a spirit of humanity and care like no other. Now you have a look at this. <clears throat> I'm going to quote to you from the Washington Post. The Washington Post admits that more than 600 Syrian children have been bused to Israel hospitals for treatment in the past year, and Israel has now treated more than 3,000 wounded Syrians. Now these are their enemies. So then goes on to say, according to the, the, the same Washington Post, Israel has transferred 360 tonnes of food, nearly 120,000 gallons of gasoline, 90 pallets of drugs and 50 tonnes of clothing as well as generators, water piping and building materials are recorded and reported by the IDF, which is the Israeli Defence Force. What other nation is prepared to give that kind of care to their enemies? Okay, so we move on. Israel's Armageddon is coming. The Bible has predicted it. Zechariah the prophet in his 14th chapter and verse 2 says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So you see, the Armageddon is coming, and the nations surrounding them are going to have their day, and they're going to find they will meet Israel's God. Now we're not going into the details uh, uh, in this particular lecture, but we're just going to notice this. In Ezekiel 38, we have the prophetic account of this time when all those nations will, uh, will invade Israel. Now here are the descriptors of Israel at this time. It, number one, it's a country that's brought back from the nations and, 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 and through sword and so on. Number two, to a land that had been waste but is now inhabited the mountains of Israel. Number three, a people that dwell safely, all of them. Number four, a land of unwalled villages dwelling confidently with a carefree spirit. Number five, a people who have acquired cattle and goods and valuable assets, including oil and gas in that now. And number six, a people who have a great spoil, the envy of many. Now I want you to notice just uh, at this point in time that there's confidence, prosperity and careless living. And there has to be a reason for that, which we'll just quickly mention shortly.
Well, doesn't that answer to the description given in Ezekiel 38? What a testimony to Bible prophecy. So we move on. Ezekiel 38 and verse 11 describes for us the uh, the confederacy that's going to invade Israel, which will involve Russia, as we see here in these pictures, but with them, Arab countries and a contingent from Europe. So it says, And thou shalt say, This is the leader of the Russian, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. For what reason? To take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods. Now we know from our news that the Russians have moved right into the area and occupy sections of particularly Syria and virtually to the borders of Israel. They are involved in the north, in Lebanon. And so what we do find is that, that, that this interest in Israel is definitely there. And one day, as Ezekiel 38 tells us, that an evil thought is going to come into the mind of that leader of the, of, of the Russian force, which we probably presume could be Vladimir Putin, and he's going to go over the border and he'll come down from the north as well. Now I want you to have a look at this. This is a very interesting development within the past few weeks. You see there a photograph of the Russian Defence Minister who, uh, who has recently visited Israel. His name is Sergei Shoigu. And he's come to Israel at a very strategic time when the Israelis had a clash with the Syrians and with Russian missiles, a battery of which the Israelis took out. But there was some damage on the Israeli side as well, which they're not telling us about. So Shoigu comes right at that very time, which is September the 16th. And he sits down with Avador Lederman, who is a Russian, who is the Israeli Defence Minister and the PM Netanyahu. And he tells them that any land that Russia occupies in Syria or in the north, if it's occupied by Russians, Israel will be protected. They will guarantee that there will be no rockets fired from those areas. That's what he's saying. This was his agreement with the Israelis in the last few weeks. Now stop and think about this. One of the greatest headaches that Israel has at the moment is the thousands of rockets that Hezbollah has in the north, the build-up of Iranian forces in the east in Syria, and Hamas in the south. And this man's coming down now to say that we are your friend. And any land that we occupy or influence, we will make sure there will be no rockets fired from there. Now if this is genuine, then it means it relieves a lot of pressure, doesn't it, in Israel. And so what do you do? When the pressure's off, you live it up. So here now we could well see a period of careless living. You've seen how just modern Israel is, but the lifestyle could get even more careless. Now look at the verse here, verse 13. The question when the Russian forces come in, the question is, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil. What do you come down here for? We understood that you were the protector of these people. We understood you were Israel's friend. What are you doing inside the country? 
Have you come to take their oil, their gas and all their other treasures? That's the question. That's just how real Bible prophecy is and how real things are to match today. Now, Zechariah 14 tells us that at this time, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So God's going to intervene now through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 38 tells us, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. My fury shall come up in my face. And there will be enormous things happening, including, of course, a massive earthquake and many other things as well, as a result of that. But at the end of this, this, this massive great disturbance and war, at the end of this we'll read, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. We're going to find out that Israel has a God, he's the only God, he's true and living, and he is the creator. Today they are completely devoted to discounting that God and anything that there is to do with the Bible. Now just the last two little slides, Israel will be reconciled to God uh, and at peace among the nations, which is the ending of Ezekiel 37. When, when, when Yahweh's servant and prince will dwell in their midst, the nation will be cleansed and God's sanctuary will be established in their, their, their midst as well. So we read in verse 26 to 28, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, that is Israel. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them. That is Ezekiel's or God's description through Ezekiel. This is what the Lord was talking about when he spoke as, uh, of reconstitution. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So here's a relationship restored. And the heathen or the nation shall know that I the Lord do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. What a tremendous change there's going to be in this world in the near future. And the final slide, thus says, Yahweh, uh, says God, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So what a, what a magnificent sign this, this nation is. God's put them in the middle of the earth, the middle of the earth, amongst all the other political identities in this world. They stumble over it, they try to get rid of it, they do everything they can to dispose of it, and nothing works. And God has got them there as a witness that our Lord Jesus is coming and that his kingdom will be a reality in the world. Good.